I was a stricken deer that left the herd long since with many an arrow deep and fixed my panting side was charged when I withdrew to seek a tranquil death in distant shades there was I found by one who had himself been hurt by the archers in his side he bore and in his hands and in his feet the cruel scars with gentle force soliciting the darts he drew them forth and healed and made me laugh before we begin we're going to have a greeting for sister becky mccormick who's not able to be with us I'm going to speak to Sister Becky right now because I know she's going to hear this CD. We want to say, Sister Becky, we love you. Uh, we all think about you here, and we know this is the first renewal that you've missed. And, and uh, when I think of Sister Becky, I think of somebody who was in her love and devotion for the truth was able to receive the truth no matter who spoke it. Whether it was served on a silver platter or a golden platter or on an earthen platter, Sister Betty always found, she always found something that was, that was worth finding. And I commend that example to you. Our, all of us have the inclination to, to gravitate to the silver platters or the golden platters. And I'll tell you, the, our interest has to be in the truth itself. And Sister Becky is an example of that. Sister Becky shines. When I think of this sort of thing, I think of Sister Becky rising up above everybody else that I know. I don't know anybody else that towers and soars as high as Sister Becky in this matter. Sister Becky, we're going to have a word of prayer for you even now as a congregation. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'll be mindful of Sister Becky there in the, in the trailer there in Kansas, Lord. We ask that thou will comfort her heart, Lord. We ask that thou will be a very present help in this time of trouble, and thou will dissuade your grief and, and sorrow, dear Father, with the, the joy which comes only from thy right hand. We ask in Jesus' name. Now our, our text today is Psalm 110. This has long been one of my favorite song, psalms. This is a psalm that everyone in the kingdom of God ought to know and ought to be thoroughly familiar with. If you don't know this psalm and its involvements, you make sure that you know it after this renewal. I'm just going to read the psalm uh, just to set the tone for our, what we have to say this morning. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook of the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Amen. Now what I purpose to do is to set before you, as it were, some water pots. I don't really uh, have a, uh, like an organized way of presenting this, I guess, uh, like I would like to. But I, I have these, these, uh, these, what I have to say, uh, these are some very good things. And, so as I set each one of these pots down, I, ask, I, I 
ask that you uh, consider them, and I, I think that you'll profit from them uh, in the way that I have too. Now, <clears throat> the Pharisees, you know, they stumbled. They stumbled at this uh, very uh, text of Scripture. Even though they were, uh, they were the scriptorians of the day, they glossed or they didn't comprehend what this was all about. The Lord said unto my Lord. They missed that. See, they missed that, see. Now, the, now the, the scripture and the law declares that the hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one Lord. But see, now there's, some, there's more involved than what appears on the surface. The Lord said unto my Lord. It's more, more involved, see. <clears throat> the Pharisees were inordinately attached to David by their tradition, knowing him only after the flesh and evidencing that they did not have the same perception of and affection for the Lord and for David's Lord that David did. Amen. Now let's think about spiritual intrigue and divine utterances. When I say spiritual intrigue, I mean something that creates like a burning inside of you when you think about this. Now... <laughs> There are several places back there in Moses and the prophets where you sense, you see that it's obvious that, that, the, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are taking conference, they're, they're taking counsel together. Oh, and I, there's times, brethren, when this is, uh, I'll tell you, this, this stirs up a burning inside of me. You know, it's like we ought to be like Moses when he turned aside to the bush. So you ought to make us turn aside and look Let's look into this a little bit more. Not just to satisfy curiosity. God forbid, let's throw curiosity out the window. Curiosity is not, the curiosity is one of the devil's arts. It's not one of Jesus' arts, okay? Now when the, what, what the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit talk about, always have age-lasting consequences and consequences that reach into the ages to come and their communications are always related to the outworking of God's eternal purpose Amen. they never say things like what are we going to do now and they're never caught off guard see that's always whenever they're talking it's always an affirmation of yes the purpose our purpose the purpose is right on schedule it's right on target. See, they're just conferring one with another that everything's right on schedule. See? Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, this divine plan and purpose have been set in place before the foundation of the world, and everything is always right on schedule. Amen. Now, let's think of some of these, these uh, places where the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are taking counsel together because this is what's See, in, in Psalm 110, in verse 1, it's the Lord said unto my Lord. Now, that's why I want to develop this a little bit. <clears throat> in Genesis 126, God said, let us, make, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. That ought to stir up intrigue, spiritual intrigue. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are here taking counsel among themselves about creating man in their likeness. And I'm going to maintain here that it's the, that it's the Father that's actually speaking here. You know what I'm saying? See now, in, in the Godhead, they see there are simplistic, oversimplistic views of the Godhead. Like this matter of... You don't like the Trinity. Now, we've got to be careful when we use words like the Trinity. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me because we, we certainly affirm our belief in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not what I'm saying. Now, they're in the, but that doesn't, there's some fine-tuning that we have to do in our understanding within those parameters. Amen. Now, think about this. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 
The Father sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Jesus came to do the Father's will. He, can, he said, I can do nothing but what I see my Father do. See, now, see, the Father all the time, He was at the helm. The Father in all, all the way through, from eternity past, see, He has been, the Father has been at the helm, see? Genesis 3, 22 and 23. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. How about that? As one of us. And then we see the purpose of God moving forward just as planned here. And then in Isaiah's prophecy, you remember in, uh, in chapter 6, this famous uh, prophecy where they saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filling the temple. Remember when he was asked, the Lord was asking, you know, who are we going to send? He said, who shall go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go for us? Then think about uh, things like in, so in the second psalm. Remember, this is, uh, <clears throat> he said here, uh, remember the, 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 the Holy Spirit rep represents the enemies of God saying, let us break their bands asunder. Not his bands, but their bands. See, there's, the, the, see speaking of the, see the Father and the Son, let us break their bands asunder. See, see what I'm saying? This is plural. There is a plural word. We all know that, right? Let it, it should be a capital T, right? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's cast them away, their cords. So you see, when the Pharisees and, the, and all of Jesus' enemies, when they were coming against him in the days of his flesh, see, they were not only coming against Jesus, they were coming against him and his father, together see see they because they see, you can't separate them you can't separate the father and the son Amen. not in not in this purpose you can't separate them in the this purpose of God see they're actually they actually you see when you oppose Jesus see there's a lot more involved than just opposing Jesus Amen. See, you're opposed see people people are opposing the, the father as well they're opposing the whole Godhead see let us break their bands asunder And then I think of, uh, he said in Psalm 2 also, he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Here's the father talking to the son. How about that? See, mo and, mo and I'll just make a passing note here that most of these, most of these uh, words here are just utterances of the father speaking to the son. Most of them are. I, and I, I can think of one that is an exception where, the, where the, actually there's a, there is a dialogue between the Father and the Son. Back, recorded back there is at least one of those places. Remember in Psalm 102 and Psalm 45, this is a con actually a conversation between the Father and the Son. And, and particularly in Psalm 102. Remember in Psalm 102, towards, right towards the middle of that psalm, the Lord Jesus is represented as saying, he was lamenting that, that you know, that, that how his shortened the Lord had shortened his days. See, and he was actually, this was, the, this was the man, this was the son of man that was, was crying out here. But, but Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, he says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. See, we're actually, here we actually, actually have a dialogue between the Father and the Son back here. And then in uh, Isaiah chapter 42 uh, through 53, there's at least five what men have called servant oracles, where, where Jehovah refers to his Son as my servant. Starting in Isaiah 42, 
all the way over into Isaiah 53. It's not the whole, not every single verse, but you, if, you'll, if you'll check that, see, it's, it spans that, that portion of Scripture. Now let's think about prophecies that were outside of David's experience. This is a unique thing. You know, now, if you, had you ever thought, now, this, now Psalm 110 really was not, it was entirely out of, what he's talking about is entirely outside of his own experience. There was no earthly circumstance which had occasioned this writing of the psalm, but rather a heavy circumstance. The Lord Jehovah was speaking a, this decisive word to David's Lord that he wanted both David and us to be privy to. This is not like Psalm 3, like when, remember when David fled from Ad, Ad, Absalom? See, now there was an earthly circumstance that was associated with that psalm. Psalm 110 is not like that. And then Psalm 51, this, you record, this is when Nathan the prophet came and, and he rebuked David for his sin with Bathsheba. And this is his prayer of uh, repentance, see? That was, a, that was occasioned by an earthly circumstance. And then, uh, and then in Psalm 53, you know, here's an, another example of, and these are just three examples. You know, I mean, just, I'm, just, I'm just kind of, you, you check the rest of them out. I mean, this is... But this is when uh, Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come into the house of Ahimelech. Let's think about David's experience back there. You know, David, David did, not, uh, he did not have the Holy Spirit like we do, but we, we know that the Spirit of God was upon him. It was upon the prophets. It was in the prophets. The Spirit of God was in the prophets. And, and, I, and I think that David was a, a man ahead of his time. He was a man, he actually, he talked like a, a new covenant man frequently, even though he lived in the days of the old covenant. It's inconceivable that David was disconnected in his heart's affection from these considerations in Psalm 110, even though they were totally outside of his own experience. It's inconceivable. Now, Psalm 110 is foundational to the rest of Scripture. It's foundational. Many of the declarations in Psalm 110 are, are, are foundational thoughts in Scripture. For example, the present reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so many people are ignorant of the present reign. Everybody said, sit thou at my right hand, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Amen. Right now, right now, he's ruling in the midst. Amen. And the nature, the nature of this reign, this was a dominion that was given to Christ by the Lord Jehovah. Sit thou at my right hand. Now this tells you somewhat about the Godhead. Now, Jeho now this tells you somewhat about the greatness of Jehovah. Now see, Jehovah, the Lord Jehovah purposed this reign, but he, he gave it to his son to execute it. See what I'm saying? It shows, and you'll see that this, this is the way the father purposes and the son executes. See, and you'll see this all the way through. This is a, this is a pattern. Now think about this. This is a rule and dominion that's in the midst of Christ's enemies. But here's another consideration. Even the reconciled ones originally came from the camp of God's enemies. Jesus didn't start out with friends. See, everybody, see, so we were all enemies, right? There weren't any friends. Amen. When Jesus started out, there weren't, there weren't any friends. See, so, so he was... See, he was so see, can you see what you, in, in this in this reign? See, he's bringing he's bringing men over from the devil's camp to his own camp. That's what this is all about. This is all about. This is a this is a reign of the implementation implementation of salvation. And this is a reign where the rod of God's strength is coming out of Zion. It's not here. It's not coming directly out of heaven. And it's not coming directly from the right hand of God, it's coming out of Zion. 
The, the church, Amen. the rain, the rod of God's strength is coming out of Zion. Amen. How about that? The, the strength, the strength that, that prevails and the strength that, 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 this, that this is talking about in this, you know, in this present time is coming out of Zion. Now the Lord is sending it. The Lord Jehovah is the one that's sending it. That's where the strength is coming from. But it's coming out of Zion. Amen. The Lord shall send the rod of his strength out of Zion. Amen. See, that showed the, the, the power and the, um, the critical nature of the, of the proclamation of God's word. See, this is because the rod of God's strength is coming out of Zion. This rod is not coming from Mount Sinai. This is a dominion through which repentance and remission of sins is given unto men. And this is a reign in which men are crossing over, as we said, from the devil's side to Jesus' side. And this is a reign that produces joy in heaven whenever, whenever sinners repent. Amen. Let's talk about the right hand. This is an, another foundational thought in Psalm 110 is the right hand of God. This is where it's, this is the, see now, see this is, this thought is, is all over scripture. It's just woven into the warp and woof of scripture. It's just everywhere. The right hand of God is the place of all power. The right hand of God is full of righteousness. The right hand of God is fullness of joy. And a place where there's pleasures forevermore. The right hand of God is glorious in power. The right hand of God is noted for dashing in pieces the enemy. Salvation and saving strength proceed forth from the right hand of God. The right hand of God is noting, noted for holding up God's saints. Check those out. Those are all references there in the Psalms. Let's talk about Messianic Psalms, whatever. I'm going to define those because, uh, because the word messianic has a lot of different meanings, okay? So, you know when we use uh, theological terms, if we, if we have to use them, it's necessary that we do define them. Amen. You know, because a lot of times the words carry with them a lot of theological ba baggage where, where you throw the word out and it means something entirely different to the person that's listening than the one and what you intended it to be. So, you know, if we're going to use, if we're going to use, occasionally, if we're going to use a theological word like this, we want to, we want to define it in the, with the words of Scripture. See what I'm saying? Amen. We want to be good stewards of defining. If we're, you know, if we're going to do that, see, because we don't want people to misunderstand what we're saying. Amen. Psalm 110 is commonly called a messianic psalm and is one where the focus of the entire psalm is on the coming Redeemer. Now, look, there's other psalms like this, and I'm not going to say it's exclusive to this. I'm just going to throw out four examples, and, and you, can just, you can just do your, you know, do a little further considering, and just, I'd like you to sort this, I'd like you to sort this out in your mind if you hadn't thought about this before, but Psalm 2, Psalm 22, Psalm 45, Psalm 110, all are outside of man's experience. They all pertain to the Messiah. There, there really is nothing. Now, like in Psalm 22, you, you may start out as a novice thinking, well, maybe this is talking about David's suffering here, but, but I'll tell you, once you get into this uh, psalm, you don't think of David anymore. You think, you think of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, he's the only one it could be talking about. He's the only one it could be talking about. Amen. And the same with Psalm 2. He's the only one it could be talking about. And Psalm 110 and Psalm 45. Now there are also messianic psalms, as men call them, which that encompass... Now when, when, here, let's, let me define the word messianic. I didn't do that yet. Messianic, we're talking about, Messianic is the adjective word of the word Messiah, right? We're talking about the person of the Messiah, referring to Christ himself. Because there are some people that hold, talk about what they call Messianic hope, where it's really, 
there's not a, it's just a hope that things will get better, right? It's just a, there's some places where messianic hope is that we're not actually anticipating the coming of a person. They're just anticipating a time when things probably will get, hopefully will get better, right? So, but that's, this is not what we're talking about. So that's why I want to define when I say messianic hope. There are some messianic psalms, as men call them, that encompass the experience of both the Lord Jesus Christ and the one writing the psalm, but reach their pinnacle of expression in relating the experience that was exclusively Christ in the day of his days of his flesh. Amen. Some examples of this are Psalm 8. Now, there's things in Psalm 8 that you, you and I can relate to, but I'll tell you, at the pinnacle of Psalm 8, I'm telling you, there's, there's things that only Jesus can relate to. Amen. Psalm 16, Psalm 34, Psalm 35, Psalm 40, Psalm 41, Psalm 45, Psalm 68, Psalm 69, Psalm 89, Psalm 102, Psalm 109, Psalm 118. And I, I don't, uh, I'm just throwing out some ones that, uh, these, I don't intend for these to be the, the only ones. See, I'm just, just giving you these as examples, okay? Now, <clears throat> Psalm 110, by far, is the most frequently portioned quoted portion of Moses and the prophets by Christ and the apostles. There is no other portion of scripture that is quoted as much as Psalm 110. Therefore, it behooves us, it behooves us to be thoroughly familiar with this. I mean, that's not ad adequately expressing it. See, we, we want to have this to be part of our own being and part of our own thinking. This is part of the way we think and reason. I'm not going to, I have a several different references here that I was just going to even quote the references. I've got about 20 or 25 references, but there's even more than that. See, now, there are places where some portions of Psalm 110 are quoted verbatim by the Lord. Remember, when he was reasoning with the apostles, portions of it verbatim. He was reasoning with them. He said, he reasoned, he said, well, if David called him Lord, how is he then his son? See, now that that threw the Pharisees for a loop. They hadn't thought about that. 